As we continue our study of the book of Acts, today I'll be reading from chapter 16, beginning at verse 11 and reading through verse 34. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And so she persuaded us. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And she did this for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. And having received such a charge, He put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposed the prisoners had fled, and he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And then he called for a light and ran in and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas, And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. And when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household. He who has ears to hear the Word of God, let them hear. Let us pray. Now, O God, give us ears to hear and hearts to understand what you wrought in this work of the apostles. 
in the response of Lydia, in the response of the Philippian jailer. And may we learn from these things what we must do to be saved. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The last time we looked at the text of Acts, we saw the beginning of the second missionary journey and how Paul had embraced Timothy as part of his entourage. You may recall that in the section of the Scripture that we read the last time, once they began this journey, they wanted to go east, and the Holy Spirit prevented it. They wanted to go west, and again, God shut the door. And we see in those brief texts the way in which the hand of God's providence often works that rather than giving us a light in the sky telling us exactly what to do, so often He will direct our paths by closing doors, by showing us what not to do and where not to go. And in this case, Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke were wondering where to go when Paul received a vision of a man from Macedonia crying in this vision, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, this, of course, was an act of special providence, an extraordinary moment of leading in the life of the apostles, but I can't help but make the application that every day in this world today, if we had eyes to see, we would see people from all over the world, from Africa and from the Islamic nations standing with their arms outstretched, appealing to the Christians here in America to come, to come and help them. It's ironic that in many places in this country, the cry of the nation is, don't come. We don't want to hear the gospel. But there are people all over this world who are begging for the help that comes from the gospel of Christ. And so, with that vision, they set sail, and they went from Troas, and they went ultimately to Philippi in Macedonia. And Philippi was one of the largest and most important cities in the region of Macedonia. It was named after their most famous king, Philip of Macedon. If you've been to the movie recently celebrating the life of Alexander the Great, you saw one of the most garish and awful portrayals of history I've ever had the misfortune of seeing on the silver screen. If you haven't gone to see it, don't bother. But in any case, one of the most ghastly parts of the movie was the portraiture of Philip, the King of Macedon, by Val Kilmer. Val Kilmer should have stopped when he played Doc Holliday. <laughs> but in any case, the city of Philippi it was an ancient city that under the reign of Philip of Macedon was rebuilt and fortified as a military outpost and then given the name in honor of King Philip of Macedon. And it's a very important place because here a church was established and we have one of the most wonderful letters of the New Testament of the Apostle Paul sent to the Philippian congregation. But also in history, not only church history, but world history, something else significant took place in this city. In the year 42 B.C., a crucial battle was fought among pretenders to the crown of Rome. The joint forces of Brutus and Cassius met on the battlefield with the joint forces of Mark Antony and Octavian. And the forces of Octavian and Mark Antony totally annihilated the armies of Brutus and Cassius, paving the way for Octavian to become the emperor of the Roman Empire, who took upon himself the name Caesar Augustus. And because of that battle site, later on, Caesar Augustus gave more fortifications to the city of Philippi and decreed that it would be a colony 
of the Roman Empire, which has significance for the events that are recorded here in the 16th chapter of Acts. But in any case, Paul and Silas now come to Philippi, and there they go out on the Sabbath day by the river. Obviously, there was no synagogue yet. Nevertheless, there were Gentiles who were God-fearers who joined for prayer along the river, which was the custom in the ancient world, because part of the Jewish prayers required ritual forms of cleansing. And so they would assemble by some source of water, such as a river or an oasis or a well or whatever. And so Paul and Silas come now down by the riverside, and they begin to talk to these women that are gathered for prayer. And among these women is this woman named Lydia, who is identified as a seller of purple, which of course was a precious dye in the ancient world. Even today, when you see people dressed up in the nations of the Arabs, you see them wearing rather bland clothes of gray and brown or black, and it was a real luxury in the ancient world to have clothes that were colorful. And the most sought-after color was the color purple, because it was the color that adorned the clothing of kings and princes. We hear the expression from the ancient world, being elevated or raised to the purple, meaning to be elevated to a seat of royalty. And this was obviously a lucrative business for Lydia, who sold these dyes and clothes dyed in purple, the purple being brought from shellfish around the nation. And Paul begins to preach to her, and notice what the Bible says in terms of her response. I don't want to miss this. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. I want you to notice all the way through the book of Acts that Luke is a consistent Calvinist. He doesn't say anything here about Lydia opening her own heart or changing her own disposition of her own soul, but Luke gives credit where the credit is always due for conversion, that it is God who opens the heart. It is God who changes the soul. It is God who, through His supernatural intervention, changes the direction and disposition of our heart, which by nature is disinclined towards the things of God and creates in the soul now a hunger and thirst for the things of God. By nature, our hearts are made out of stone until the Holy Ghost changes that heart and gives it life. Then it begins to pulsate and beat for the things of God. And that's what happens to Lydia. And she's converted, and she's the first convert in the continent of Europe mentioned in the Bible. And in her response, she is so excited about her new life that she says to Paul and Silas and their entourage, come, come to my house, stay there, which they did and probably started a house church there. But it wasn't long until Paul in his ministry began to be harassed by this slave girl that the Scripture teaches us was possessed by a devil. She was given over to the occult, divining and practicing necromancy, that sort of thing, trying to predict the future with her tarot cards and her fortune-telling, gazing into her crystal ball or whatever other implements that she had at that day. And it was a lucrative business. Everybody came to her and to her masters. They would pay money to get her prognostications, her forecasts, and on the basis of her forecast, they would invest in their stock market and that era because they had the inside dope from this woman who was giving these prophecies. And notice what it says about her, that she follows Paul and Silas around. It's really she's stalking them. The force of the language here in the text is that she doesn't leave them out of their sight. Wherever they go, she's going, and she keeps saying, 
over and over and over again, these men are the servants of the Most High God who <laughs> proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now, you would think if you had somebody who was esteemed to have supernatural gifts and powers in a pagan world, if they were screaming to the public that these preachers were speaking the word of the Most High God and was giving to them the news of salvation, that that would be an occasion of great comfort to these missionaries. But it's obvious from the context here that this woman was saying these words in a scornful, mocking manner, which is typical of the demonic world. Remember in the Gospels that the first ones during Jesus' earthly ministry to recognize Him for who He was were the demons, who called Him the Holy One of Israel, which indeed He was, and said, What do you have to do with us, O Holy One? Have you come to torment us before our time? And Jesus rebuked them, because though they gave testimony to the truth of Jesus and the truth of the message here of the Apostle Paul, it was done in acrimony, it was done scornfully, through clenched teeth, trying to make fun of what the apostles were proclaiming. And finally, Paul gets sick of it. It says he's not just annoyed, but he gets greatly annoyed. And you know, one of the most dangerous things you could do in the ancient world was to annoy the Apostle Paul. <laughs> that was not a good idea. But they greatly vexed and annoyed the Apostle Paul until finally he becomes involved in the act of exorcism and commands the spirit that possessed this slave girl to come out of her. And the moment of the command the demon is loosed, and the woman is set free. Now, anybody with any compassion, including her owners, would have rejoiced that this woman had been delivered from a devil. Instead, they were outraged because they were in danger of losing the source of income that she so richly provided for them. And so they grab a hold of Paul and Silas, and they drag him into the agora, into the marketplace. Now, in the marketplace is not only the place where business is transacted, but it's also the place where often trials are heard, hearings are set forth, and the magistrates will come and hear testimony against criminals. So they drag Paul and Silas before the magistrates, and they lie, they bear false witness, they don't come and say, oh, these guys are guilty of liberating this woman from a devil. Rather, he said, these guys are stirring up exceedingly great trouble in our town. And not only that, they're trying to encourage us to acts of sedition. They're telling us to practice religion and customs of the Jews, which are not legal among the Romans. So they tell all these lies. And as a result, the magistrate sides with the crowd, and the multitude and an act of frenzy come, and they start to tear the clothes off of Paul and Silas. Now, Luke doesn't tell us to what degree they stripped them of their garments. It wasn't unusual in circumstances like this for the prisoners to be stripped totally nude, because part of their punishment would be to be exposed to humility and to shame. But that didn't necessarily happen here. At least they were stripped to the waist for a utilitarian purpose, that they may feel the full measure of the beating they were about to receive. And so, Paul and Silas were beaten with sticks like canes. Now, in the Jewish punishment, in their code, there was a limited number of times in which a lash or a stick could be applied to a prisoner. Under Roman penal codes, there was no such limit. So we have no idea how long or how severely Paul and Silas were subjected 
to this merciless beating. All that we are told is that they were given so many stripes that their backs were laid bare, they were brutally beaten, and then, to add insult to injury, were dragged in their bloody pain and thrown into the prison. And not just into the prison, but according to the directive given to the jailer, they were taken to the innermost part of the prison, which may have even been a subterranean part, you know, below the level of the ground, and in the dankest part of the prison, and not only to be held there in the most secure part of the prison, but they were to be put in the stocks. Now, you've seen pictures of the old Puritans in New England when they would put somebody in the stocks with their hands and their feet, and they'd be held out there for public humiliation. Well, the purpose of the stocks here was twofold. In the first place, the stocks were there to bind their feet so securely that it would make it impossible for them to escape. And secondly, the stocks themselves were fitted in such a way as to inflict a kind of torture on the prisoners. Anytime they tried to move their feet, more pressure would be applied to them to increase their pain. So here they are in humiliation, isolation, having been beaten within an inch of their lives, thrown into the midst of the prison, and secured there by the stocks, for all intents and purposes in a hopeless situation. And then we get that merciful word that I thank God almost every time I see it in the New Testament, that word that's so important to me and to my salvation that I had a lady once embroider it so I could hang it in my office. It's that three-letter word, but… It signifies something's going to change here. In this case, we read, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were crying and complaining out to God. No, it's not what it says. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. In the midst of their affliction, in the midst of their misery, the apostles are singing praises to their God. And every prisoner in that prison heard it. Can you imagine what they were thinking? What's wrong with these nuts? Listen to them. Look at them. You can hardly recognize them as human beings. They're so raw from their torture. And what are they doing but singing to their God? And suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Notice this. It doesn't say that there's a mild tremor, a two on the Richter scale. This is a great earthquake, not just the kind that shakes the building and shakes the doorways and causes the jars to fall on the floor and break, but the earthquake is so great that the very foundation of this prison is moved. And immediately, all the doors sprang open, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep, seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, did the only thing a jailer could do under the Roman system. He took out his sword and was about to fall upon it. Among the Romans, if they failed to keep their duty, suicide is not seen as an act of cowardice or as a sin, but it's seen as a virtue, that you accept your lot and the consequences of your failure by falling upon your sword. 
And the jailer wakes up, and he sees the condition of the prison. The doors are open. The chains are gone. He doesn't see any of the prisoners. And the assumption he makes is that they've all already fled. He's lost their prison. He knows the Roman law, that if he loses somebody who's there in a capital offense, he has to replace that person. And so to save his honor, he takes the knife, and he begins to plunge it into his heart. And if he accomplished that task, ladies and gentlemen, one more second, that man would have been in hell forever. But just as he's ready to stab himself, he hears the Apostle Paul crying in a loud voice, Stop! Don't kill yourself! We're all here! What? What? You gotta be kidding me. You're all here. And he starts looking around, one, two, three, four, five, six, starts counting the numbers. So the jailer called for a light, and he gets a torch, and he runs in, and he falls down, trembling in front of Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out of the prison, and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I don't know how many times I've heard this story, read this story. You've heard it too. But every time I hear it, I am puzzled by the question, what must I do to be saved? Because I don't know for sure what the Philippian jailer had in his mind when he asked that question. Because I know that the word to save in the Bible is used in many different ways. When we hear it being used, we assume that the question has to do with ultimate salvation, being translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and becoming children of God. But the basic generic meaning of to save in the New Testament simply means to be rescued from some terrible condition or consequence. People come to Jesus in the Gospels who are suffering from an incurable disease, and Jesus heals them and says, your faith has saved you. Save them eternally or save them simply from the malady. Can't always be sure. If the armies of Israel go against the Philistines and the tide of the battle is in favor of the Philistines until the last moment God intervenes, the Jews experience salvation, rescue from some calamity. So therefore, the verb to save means basically to be rescued from some calamity. And perhaps the calamity the Philippian jailer has in mind is, can you guys tell me how I'm going to be able to explain this to my superiors? What do I have to do to be saved? That would be the proximate concern that he would have. And maybe Paul just takes advantage of that to elevate his urgency to a higher degree and speaks about the ultimate sense of salvation. I don't know, but my guess is that this man understood what he was asking. Even though he's a pagan, even though he's not familiar with Judaism or Christianity, he's a human being. And the Bible makes it clear that God has revealed Himself in His holiness manifestly and clearly to every human being. And whether you're religious or irreligious, that revelation is so clearly known in the depths of your soul that every single person in this world, every single person in this room knows, and you know that you know, that someday you're going to have to face your Maker. And the worst of all possible calamities that you could ever have to endure would be to endure His wrath. You know it's coming. You flee from it. Many flee from it until it's too late. And I think this man was quickened in his conscience. He realized that his situation before God was far more desperate than it was before Augustus Caesar, or whoever was reigning at this point. 
And he said, what do I have to do to be saved? And what does Paul say? Well, from this day forth, you have to be a good boy. You have to stop torturing your prisoners. You have to give them enough to eat. You can't tie them up too tightly in the stocks. I want you to go out and collect money on Christmas Day for the poor. I want you to become a deacon in the church. No. Rather, Paul said, what must you do to be saved? You need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. Your wife will be saved. Your household will be saved. And anybody that puts their faith in Christ anywhere in this world will be saved. That is, if you trust in Christ and in Christ alone, never again do you have to fear the wrath of God, the wrath that most certainly will come. But you can't just have a nebulous faith in some supreme being, some higher power. This week I got the news of the recantation of one of the most famous philosophers of the 20th century, Anthony Flew, one of the leading voices of analytical philosophy, who was one of the most outspoken critics of theism, self-styled atheist, who's famous for the compiling of the so-called parable called Flew's parable that proves that God doesn't exist. And he finally, now in his early 80s, fesses up and he says, I can't argue anymore against the appearance of design in the universe. The, the evidence for design is so compelling that I have to agree and I have to admit that there is some superior intelligence that's created this world. And all the Christians are celebrating. He says, I don't mean Yahweh, and I don't mean Christ. I just mean you've got to have a superior intelligence to create the world. He should have learned that a long time ago from his own parable. But you see, even now, He's like W.C. Fields on his deathbed when he found reading his Bible, and they said, W.C., what are you reading the Bible for? And he said, looking for loopholes. <laughs> Anthony Flew is trying to hedge his bets, but he still doesn't come clean. What does he have to do to be saved? Not just aver the existence of a superior intelligence. That in superior intelligence by which he can be saved has a name, and his name is Jesus the only name through which men might be saved. Now, in one sense, looking back on his life, the thing that occasioned his conversion, the great earthquake, and the near escape of the prisoners, is obviously the most terrifying thing that ever happened to the Philippian jailer. And yet, this was his lucky day because this was the day that the facade was removed. His psychological defenses were destroyed. He fell on his face and said, what must I do to be saved? And he was offered Christ. And he went to Christ as fast as he could. He trusted in Christ and in Christ alone for his salvation. And he went to his home, we are told, exceedingly glad. And he showed his gratitude. Paul, Silas, come here. Let me bathe your wounds. How could I have participated in these things? Let me feed you from my table. That's a man who's tasted of the sweetness of Christ and has experienced for the first time what it means to be saved. I lose sleep worrying about any who come to this church on Sunday morning in the choir, in the strings, in the brass, visitors, members, regular attenders who come to church but have never received Him. You need to ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Because the answer is not esoteric, it's plain. Put your trust 
in Christ. Trust Him, not yourself. And you will be saved now and forevermore. Let's pray. What a marvelous thing this is, O oh God, that in the midst of our fear, on the edge of suicide, you intervene and you give to us the promise of salvation if we put our trust in Christ. Father, if there's anyone in this room whose heart is still closed, please open it, as you did for Lydia, that they may give heed to the truth of the gospel. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.